Today's reading from the letter of James seems to ramble a bit, almost as though James is trying to catch a tiger by the tail. And in a sense, he is. He's addressing how we humans deal with negative emotions. He describes these emotions warring within us, but instead of dealing with them inside of us and calming them down, we take them out into the world, out onto the streets, and we war against each other. We try to make ourselves feel better by coveting and taking things from other, and even in some translations, James says, people kill each other over this. Not because the people around them have done anything wrong, but because people are too afraid to actually look inside themselves and find a way to calm down their negative emotions. Psychologists have a name for this process. It's called projection. We get all riled up with feelings like anger and fear, and instead of calming them down, we project them onto other people. You're the reason I feel this way, or if it weren't for people like you, everything would be all right. I have every right to feel angry or frightened because of you. The problem with this approach, of course, is that it reduces people to live, complicated people made in God's image into cartoon figures in our little psychological drama. Other people become our enemies or are the reason the whole world is going to ruin. Someone, this happens all the time when you're driving, right? You're driving along, everything's okay, and then someone cuts you off and you hear these words fly out of your mouth as you curse this person who's just cut you off. Suddenly, the full complexity of their wonderful being is reduced to the fact that they cut you off, and they're this or they're that, words I can't say in a sermon, <laughs> but which have certainly come out of your mouth. And it's like they just become this cartoon character in your life, and you forget who they really are. Those facile judgments are always a clue that the real monsters we fear are actually inside of us but are being ignored, so we just project them out onto the outside world, bigger than ever, painted onto other people. They become the screen for our projections, characters in our movie. And James reminds us that this leads to us being judgmental of other people. But the right to judge people in all of their complexity does not belong to us. Only God is competent to do that. So when we do it, James says, we are overstepping our bounds. And even worse, we're losing sight of how each person is made in the image of God. Our willingness to turn other people into cartoon figures is an insult to them and to their maker. These psychological projections can have long-lasting deadly effects. Last Sunday was the 20th anniversary of 9-11. The attacks were deeply traumatic for the people who witnessed them. In Manhattan, some 3,000 people died on that day. And it's estimated that at least 400,000 people in lower Manhattan were directly affected by the collapse of the two towers. They breathed in a toxic soup of chemicals and pulverized metal contained in the dust. It was released by the fall of the buildings. And today, many, many thousands of people suffer from physical illnesses related to that toxic dust. For the first responders who came to Ground Zero on 9-11 and the days after, and there were 30,000 of them, there have been long-term psychological consequences too. It's now estimated that among the surviving first responders, 16% suffer from mental health problems such as depression, substance abuse, and post-traumatic stress disorder. These are the people who all the world saw as America's heroes in 9-11, and yet they have paid a really, really heavy price. But America as a whole, as a nation, was traumatized too. For the first time in decades, Americans felt vulnerable, fearful, and victimized. In the space of an hour, a self-confident nation which had won the Cold War was suddenly seething with negative emotions. Fear, worry, anger, and a sense of victimization <clears throat> gripped the entire nation. 
This was trauma, excuse me, <clears throat> this was trauma at a collective scale. The question was what were they going to do about it? How were they going to deal with those feelings? Would they take James's advice and try and calm down? Or would they project them outwards? Well, they did not decide to stop and calm down. Instead, three days after the attack, this bill was presented to Congress and the Senate. It's known as the Authorization for Military Force Act. It is very short. This is most of it. There's just a little bit on a second page. Its active section is actually just 60 words long, and it reads that the president is authorized to use all necessary and appropriate force against those nations, organizations, or persons he determines, planned, authorized, committed, or aided the terrorist attacks that occurred on September 11, 2001, or harbored such organizations or persons in order to prevent any future acts of international terrorism against the United States by such nations, organizations, or persons. You'll notice that the bill does not mention Al-Qaeda or Afghanistan. Instead, it asks for permission to wage war on all terrorists, governments, and individuals who might have been involved in the 9-11 attacks. In short, it asks for permission to wage a war on terror. This act was used to authorize the invasion of Afghanistan, which followed soon after. However, in the name of fighting terrorism, this act was also used to invade Iraq without needing to consult Congress even though Iraq has had no proven links to 9-11 at all. This act enabled the Bush administration to detain, detain, sus, I'm sorry, to detain suspects indefinitely at Guantanamo Bay in Cuba. And these 60 words have enabled presidents since to bypass Congress each time they wanted to launch attacks against terrorists. When President Obama wanted to attack ISIS, in Syria, he used this bill, even though ISIS didn't even exist in 2001. This bill, in short, became a blank check for using military force around the world. The bill passed easily in Congress and the Senate. Instead of trying to calm down the feelings which had been erupting since uh, during 9-11, the Americans took their anger and fear out into the world to wage war on enemies real and imagined. There's an old Buddhist story about this kind of process. It goes like this. Two Buddhist monks are walking along and they come to a river. The river doesn't have a bridge. It's too, too wide to cross. Uh, rather, it doesn't have a bridge. So the only way to get across it is you have to wade. And it's not too deep, fortunately. There happens to be a young woman sitting on the shore and she hasn't been able to get across and she needs help. And so she asks them to help her to get across the river. Problem is that these Buddhist monks have taken a vow of celibacy and they're not even supposed to touch women or get close to them. But one of the monks decides he's gonna do it. So he grabs the woman and he puts her on, her on his shoulders and he wades across the river and puts her down on the other side. Meanwhile, the other monk also crosses the river and gets to the other side. The woman says, thank you. The two monks say goodbye, and they walk along, and they continue with their journey. After about two or three hours, the monk who carried the woman notices that there's something going on with the other monk. He seems quite perturbed by something. So he asks him, what's going on? And the monk erupts. He says, don't you understand? It's against the rule for us to touch women. You broke your vows just then when you carried that woman. Doesn't that mean anything to you? And the other monk just took a breath and said, I carried that woman for two minutes. You're still carrying her. The American war on terror ensured that 9-11 continued long after the attack. By embracing fear and anger, that fear and anger just grew. Innocent Muslims all over the world were vilified they became the screen onto which American fear and anger was projected. 3,000 people died on 
But in the 20 years since Afghanistan was invaded, over 38,000 civilians have died. Innocent civilians, 38,000, more than 10 times as many as died in 9-11. In Iraq, over 180,000 civilians have died. As James predicted in his letter, when we take our negative emotions into the street, into the world, and we misjudge, we will misjudge people, turning them into monsters. In our desire to regain control of our lives, we will even claim that we can control the future. Yet as Afghanistan has fallen back into the hands of the Taliban, the American bid to end the existence of terrorism looks terribly naive. In his letter, James suggests that there's an alternative to this approach, one we must embrace for the sake of ourselves and the welfare of the world. He calls it the law of love. It's God's way. And James chooses interesting words to express this. He, he compares God to a jealous lover, a lover who is chasing us, constantly trying to woo us. And that God is hurt when we choose the ways of the world instead of God's approach. If we were to just stop and turn towards God, God would rush to our side. But to do that requires putting aside our pride and adopting an attitude of humility. We have to be ready to listen, to accept that we might not have all the answers, and that our feelings aren't always the best guide to what we should do next. You know, Christianity has been torn in two directions in terms of its idea about how do we get closer to God. The most common approach is basically it says that we need to earn our way to get to God. Right? We need to score brownie points, acting morally and doing everything right, and the people who do the most right will get the closest to God. Usually it's imagined that when we get close to God, it'll be in the afterlife. Right? And we'll experience bliss because we racked up enough moral points to get there. That whole approach of basing closeness to God on behavior was rejected by the Apostle Paul, and yet it still seeped into Christianity and took over. Perhaps it's just part of human nature that we think that, well, if something's important, then I must be in charge of it. And that puts faith in, in allows us to take charge of our faith by saying, well, I can get to God. I'll do the work. The other approach, though, which is more intuitive and harder to get our heads around, is what James is drawing on. And he says that God is actually doing all the work for us. We don't have to chase God. God is chasing us. God is right here, closer than your skin, right next to you all the time. God wants to be in a relationship with us. Even when we're failing, even when we're ignoring God, God wants us to wake up, to stop sleepwalking. A sacred world is all around us, and God wants us to join her in that way of living, opening ourselves to forgiveness and love of all creation, even the people who bother us. But God knows that the ways of the world are seductive, that our hearts are hardened and our spiritual senses are dulled every day. So God has chosen to have believers write down their experiences of being with God, of, to explain what happened when they got close to God. And we call those experiences scripture. And God has made it possible for us to keep meeting even 2,000 years later in buildings like this and online using technology no one had dreamt of even 30 years ago so that we can keep hearing these words and keep hearing that there is another way. hoping that at least a few of us will listen. On September 14, 2001, before that war on terror bill was passed, that morning, members of Congress and the Senate and other distinguished guests all gathered in at the Washington Memorial, which is the big cathedral that's in Washington where official, official services are held. And it was a memorial service for the victims of 9-11. Billy Graham, Reverend Billy Graham, provided the homily, calling for unity and promising that 9-11 would be remembered 
as a day of victory for the American people as they rallied together. But before Graham spoke, the service started with a few words from Reverend Nathan Baker. And he said a prayer that included these words. Let us also pray for divine wisdom as our leaders consider the necessary actions for national security, wisdom of the grace of God, that as we act, we not become the evil we deplore. Those words struck one member of Congress very, very deeply. Her name was Barbara Lee. She was a black congresswoman from the San Francisco area. She was serving her first term in Congress. Lee was a Christian and the daughter of a uh, lieutenant colonel in the army. She'd been an army brat as a kid, moving all over the country, following her dad as his posts changed. She was also a strong advocate for black and women's rights. In college, she insisted that they change the rules so that she could become the first black cheerleader at her college. On that morning after the memorial service, she joined the other members of Congress as they went back to the House to vote on that bill on the War on Terror. And before the vote, she stood up and declared that she was not comfortable with giving the president a blank check for waging war now and forever against terror. And here's part of what she said. This unspeakable act on the United States has really forced me, however, to rely on my moral compass, my conscience, and my God for direction. September 11th changed the world. Our deepest fears now haunt us. Yet I am convinced that military action will not prevent further acts of international terrorism against the United States. This is a very complex and complicated matter. Now this resolution will pass, although we all know that the president can wage a war even without it. However difficult this vote may be, some of us must urge the use of restraint. Our country is in a state of mourning. Some of us must say, let's step back for a moment, let's just pause just for a minute and think through the implications of our actions today so that this does not spiral out of control. When the vote was called, Barbara Lee discovered that she was the only person in Congress to vote against it. It passed 420 to 1. In the Senate, it passed 98 to 0. She had listened to the law of love, to the words of God, and decided against acting out of haste and negative emotion. She'd been raised by her father, a lieutenant colonel, who had told her you never go into a military action unless you have a clear strategy and a clear exit strategy. And this bill had neither of those. After she voted, the very first person to call her was her father. And she walked away from the house back to her office and her father congratulated her. You did the right thing, kid. And he was really proud of her. As you can imagine, though, others were not so kind. By the time she got back to her office, the phone was ringing off the hook. Thousands of people called and wrote letters to condemn her as a traitor to the nation. One letter compared her to Judas and Hitler. She received death threats, and she required a 24-hour-a-day security detail that followed her everywhere she went, not just when she was at work and at home, but when she went to church, when she went shopping, she always had security people because she was receiving so many death threats. The Senate had voted unanimously for the bill. Joe Biden said yes. Bernie Sanders said yes. Nancy Pelosi said yes. People who are all still with us and active. But she said no. Where did she get the strength to say no? She says that in the days before, she consulted her mentors and her pastor and her parents. She remembered the words of Martin Luther King, who was a, one of her heroes. But most of all, she said, 
It was the words she heard that morning at the memorial that made the difference. Words inspired by Scripture said in a church. At the time, people predicted that she wouldn't get re-elected. Her political career was finished. Her district, though, includes Berkeley, California, the site of the famous anti-war protests in the 1960s. They were happy to re-elect her, and she's now serving her 12th term in a row. She was a member of Joe Biden's campaign committee and helped draw up the policies which got him elected. Standing up to the ways of the world is possible. Barbara Lee now looks like the only elected representative who clearly saw what was coming. She attributes her strength to her faith and the words that she heard in church that fateful morning. God is always chasing us, always trying to get our attention. God wants to be close to us and help us through this life to see there's another way of living that doesn't rely on violence, fear, and anger. God wants to help us give up our illusions and projections so that we can start living a real life where love can flourish. Because as the first psalm says, which we heard Bob read today, the way of the wicked is doomed doomed to fail. Amen.